Does anybody remember what I told you I've got written in a sign there to the right of my desk that I keep reading all the time? Anybody remember that? Besides Sister Kim? Amen. It says your feelings will betray you. And I have had that confirmed to me on more than one occasion. And I feel like that I really importantly need to let folks know this morning you got to quit living for God based upon how you feel. You can't keep living for God based upon if you're feeling good or if you got money in the bank or if your car's running good or if the roof ain't leaking. You know, all that stuff can be messed up in your life and God's still good. Amen. And the truth is still truth, Brother Rice. Because the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. We've got to hold to that. We've got to hold to that. Amen. Boy, I'm glad to see everybody here. It's a good-looking congregation this morning. One of my feelings said after my phone rang so many times and so many text messages and even had one show up here this morning and say they weren't going to be able to be here today, I thought, my goodness, we'll be slim pickings. But once again, my feelings betrayed me. Amen. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really, really happy to see everyone here. Please continue to pray for the sick. Pray for those that are sick. We, we got to have some healing. We got to have a breakthrough. Amen. In the garden, the garden of Eden, where it all began, amid all the beauty, the peace, the splendor, etc., there was an introduction made. The Lord created something in the garden, Brother David, that it never, never completely says, and God said, let there be. Or it never says, and God saw it was good. But Sister Leanne, there was an introduction made into the garden that would dictate the future of all of mankind. And in many cases, I, 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 would, I would submit to you that it, that it has uh, affected more things than even the trees or the sun or the moon or any of the other beautiful things that the Lord created, all the beautiful animals and, and the flowers. And, and we do live in a beautiful world, amen? I don't, don't, don't get so wrapped up in all the craziness that's going on to fail to appreciate that the Lord did a good job still yet. But what was introduced in the garden that has affected, it, it's affected you today and it's affecting the entire world today is the Lord created the power of choice. He introduced the power of decision making. And we who live in America, and as tough as it might be at times, I'm still happy to be here. I still get goosebumps when they sing the Star Spangled Banner. And I still feel my, tit my eyes welling up when I see two old veterans hugging in front of a statue somewhere and tears pouring down their face. We live in a good country. We live in a blessed country. But you, everybody, everybody that's under the sound of my voice today, you're here because you chose to be. You made a choice to be. We make a choice to get up. We make a choice to eat. I, I've heard it said that when people come from other countries to America, they sometimes sit dumbfounded at the choice of restaurants that we have to go out and eat. At the, the, the choice of, of food in the supermarket. How many of you can even remember uh, when, when we were little children and 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in, in my case, Brother David, that the choices have, have expanded uh, tremendously. I don't know that I can even, you know, you used to have like three or four different kinds of sodas that you could buy and, and there was like three ice cream choices that you could make, you know, push-ups and Mickey Mouse bars and, and Nutty Buddies. That's about all that you had, you know. But now we, we've got so many more choices out there and the truth is that you, you find a church of your choice too. But I want to let you know there is a true way. There is a right way. And it ain't your way and it ain't my way, but it's God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's going to be the way of the book. Adam was given the right choice. And when you live for God, you will always be given the right choice. 
always. Adam was given the right choice, but ultimately it was going to be up to him as to whether he should obey it or not. In effect, in effect, the choice was made for Adam. The Lord said, don't eat and live. Eat and die. Oh my goodness gracious, what kind of, what kind of uh, choice is that? It's made for me, Brother Pete. It's easy for you to say. But then the power of deception was introduced by the enemy. And they were deceived into thinking the wrong choice was the right choice. Now we often use the power of choice as a crutch to either do something we shouldn't or not to do something we should. For instance, I heard this the other day. Someone living in a particular manner, particular life. And, and they said, I prayed for the Lord to make me quit being this way. And he didn't. So that must mean one of three things. Number one, he's okay with it. Number two, I'm just doomed to live this way. Or number three, he'll change me when he's ready. So in the meantime, I'm going to continue to live and behave the way I'm living until the Lord steps in and changes me. God will never make you make the right choice. We have to make the decision to forsake sin and embrace holiness in our own minds. You won't be forced into making the right decision by God. Now sometimes life will and circumstances will, but God will never force you to make the right decision. This is a cute story that was in the Sunday school book we just got today. An illustration that fits perfectly for this message today. There's a little boy named Bobby who desperately wanted a new bicycle. And his plan was to save his nickels, dimes, and quarters until he finally had the money to buy a new 10-speed. Each night he asked God to help him save his money. And kneeling beside his bed, he prayed, Dear Lord, Please help me save my money for a new bike. We can all relate to that. But then the second part of his prayer was, and please don't let the ice cream truck come down my street again tomorrow. I've got a goal and I've got a plan and I, I know what's really wanting to happen here and I've got it, everything worked out and it's going to do it. I'm following the right place, but Lord, don't put anything in my path that might cause me to ups get upset a little bit. Lord, don't put anything in my path that's going to hinder me. Don't allow anything to come. I'm going to do right. I'm going to live right. I'm going to follow your ordinances as long as you don't let nothing get in my way. Oh, that would be easy. That would be easy, but if that was the way it's going to be, the Lord would have never given Adam and Eve that choice. There are many of us that live for God the way Bobby got after his new bicycle. I'm going to stay committed, and I'm going to stay true, and I'm going to live right, and I'm going to come to every prayer meeting and come to every Bible study, and I'm going to be faithful to every service as long as ice cream man don't come down the street. As long as nothing else gets in my plans that I want more. Because, you see, the bicycle was down the road. The bicycle was, was the vision that the ice cream got in the way of. Because right that minute, he didn't want nothing else anymore, and he wanted that ice cream. Let me tell you something. Ice cream truck will do crazy things to your mind. That sound from the ice cream truck is like, it's like the, the siren song in the Odyssey, you know. It's just like a magnet. It's, it's just like I've seen some of the greatest fits thrown by kids who heard the ice cream truck coming and mama couldn't, they couldn't get in the house and get any money quick enough to get out there. But we do the same thing in living for God. There, there are things, hear me well right now. Hear me well. The, the Lord has really directed me to this because, Sister Maria, the truth of the matter is I wasn't really feeling it. So I'm going to show up and change it. And, and as fast as I could sit down and try to start changing it, Brother David, the Lord started bringing more out of it. This is going to help change your life. But, but we've got good intentions so much of doing the right thing and living for God. And, and the next service, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to do right and I'm going to submit. And I'm going to start paying my tithes. I'm going to start giving an offering. And I'm going to start doing all kinds of good stuff until I walk out of church and I'm on a flat. Come on now. And then all of a sudden, I've been forced into making another choice. Ain't that just like the devil, I'll say. 
Sometimes that's the Lord. According to the National Statistics on Recidivism, the Bureau of Justice Statistics Studies have found high rates of recidivism among released prisoners. One study tracked 404,638 prisoners in 30 states after their release from prison in 2005. The researchers found that within three years of release, about two-thirds of released prisoners, or 67% of released prisoners, were rearrested. Within five years of release, 76.6% of released prisoners were rearrested. Now, many would sneer and turn their nose up at this when presented with it, but the numbers don't lie. And although some percentage of these offenders would repeat regardless, there's evidence that many people repeat their offenses in order to return to jail simply for the security that they feel there. And the fact that they have a lack of confidence in being able to make the right decisions that are necessary to walk the straight and narrow. I remember Granny and, and Mama's brothers and sisters lived up in St. Louis and, and they had a guy that was kind of a legend among them, a great big old tall fella. His name was Big Bill. And, and Big Bill spent more time in prison than he did out, Brother David. And, and he, he got out of prison and he so highly anticipated his release date. And Sister Leanne, everybody was just so happy because Big Bill was coming back to the neighborhood. But Brother Pete, Big Bill made it two days until he got rearrested. And he, you want to know what he was doing? He robbed a junior food mart put their safe on a dolly and started pushing it down the middle of the biggest street they had up there, wanting to get caught. The desire wasn't to, rock, to gain anything. The desire was to go back because he couldn't function without somebody making his decisions for him. Think about this for just a minute. Everybody, even, even if you... You know, uh, even if you uh, don't necessarily like music, and there, there's some, I can take it or leave it. You know, it, it's, uh, sometimes I've driven long trips and drive 100 miles and never turn the radio on and just me in the silence. But I do have a favorite song. The truth of the matter is everybody's got a favorite song. Think about that right now. What is your, I got several favorite songs, but I, I've still got some, you know, that, that especially, boy, those old Henson songs and stuff, man, they just still, man, I get the feeling that, you know, I loved them. You know, Call Me Gone and, and all of that. Boy, that was great. Them are my favorite songs. But I want you to think about something. You know, think about something just a little bit here. Did you choose that song to be your favorite? Did you say they got that song out and I knew it was going to come out and that's going to be my favorite song? before you ever heard it? Did, did you choose to, for that to be your favorite song? Or was it chosen for you? The truth of the matter is, the appeal, the beat, the words or the message, and the artist all work together to make that decision for you. You didn't decide it. You didn't decide, this is going to be my favorite song. Don't really like it all that good right now, but I'm going to listen to it a thousand times, and then it's going to become my favorite. No. Same way with a book or, you know, uh, no, nobody, I, I mean, I, I don't really know. There may be a couple of, of crazy folks, you know, that, that uh, decided that, you know, your math book at school was going to be your favorite book. I'm just going to read it for the rest of my life. No, the truth of the matter is, is you read a book sometime and, and hopefully the Bible is one of your favorite books, but, but everybody has a favorite book or favorite movie or, or something. They're all decided for the same reasons. How, how is it decided what's your favorite? Favorite song, movie, book, whatever. Even, even friends. You know, it's how it affects you, Brother Billy, that determines... Me choosing to like it. Me choosing to be a part of it. Me choosing, when it comes on the radio, I tell everybody, y'all need to stop talking for a few minutes. Right? Huh? Is that fair? Is that fair? Boy, I like that. I like that. You know, even the thing, the reason I use the song is because, you know, you could have been 13 years old and, and you and your first boyfriend or girlfriend had your song. 
And you can hear it 35 years later and it'll affect you the same way then that it did back then. But you didn't choose for it to be that way. Circumstances in the way that it affected you decided that for you. There is an appeal to living for God. The promises of God are true. The benefits are too numerous to list. The feeling of being in the presence of the Lord, there's nothing like it. And we really, really believe that there's a heaven that I've never been to before. Because the Bible says, and, and, and when I die or when the trumpet sounds, I want to be there. And the thought of it, no tears and no sadness and no sorrow. And I get to be face to face with Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, man, live forever. Our church services, boy, they're enjoyable. We've got a great camaraderie being built and a lot of new people which breathes new life. We've got good music, we've got good preaching. Huh? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. We've got a good spirit of cooperation and desire. And the penalty for not living for God is you'll go to hell. Say, oh, now you, I knew you was going to start judging here or something. I ain't judging nobody. I'm nobody's judge, but that's what the book says. Rarely, rarely does anyone ever attend one of our services and leave regretting that they came. Rarely. Generally, matter of fact, I can't think of a time when I was greeted with anything, but I'll be back. I loved it. Love what I feel. Love the music. Love everything. I'll be back. Boy, it was great. They'll hug you. They'll, you know, sometimes they'll cry. Sometimes they'll stand there and wait their turn just to say, boy, it was great. I'll be back. I loved it. It would seem... It would seem that living for God would be a choice that was made for you, kind of like your favorite song. Now, don't, don't, now think about that. Nothing bad about it. Nothing. It feels good. I enjoy it. It affects me in a positive way, man. It, you know, oh my goodness gracious, man, it's a beautiful thing. It's wonderful. You get together with a bunch of Holy Ghost filled people and, and feel the presence of the Lord begin to move and, and you get you know the right song going or the right service or the right vein of the Holy Ghost going, Brother David. Oh my goodness gracious, it's powerful. It's beautiful. It's rich. and It affects you. It affects you. But then we walk away and that flat tire or that circumstance in our house or, or we start really thinking about, oh, I just don't know about that. I just don't know about that. It would seem, man, living for God. I, I can't tell you nothing bad about it. There's not anything bad. I can't tell you, Brother David, I have no regrets. There's nothing that I go to bed at night thinking, Lord, I wish you'd let me do that. Nothing. Because the benefits to living for God, my goodness. Words can't really describe how beautiful it is to be in the presence of the Lord. But you got a favorite song, and you got a favorite book, and you got a best friend, and all of that you choose to continue in because of how it affects you. But living for God, living for God affects you, I would argue, more profoundly. But yet we have to make a decision, do we want to or not? Matthew 7 and 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Now, everything I, that I've talked about in living for God and, and the beautiful things in living for God would make you think, Brother Billy, that everybody would want to do it. Come on now. Who wouldn't want to? 
Who wouldn't want to experience what we get to experience? Who wouldn't want to have the comfort of knowing that when your kids get sick at night, you lay your hands on their head and you pray for them and you got faith they're going to be all right? Who wouldn't want to be able to lay your head down and sleep peacefully? Who wouldn't want to know that there was a covering of the Holy Ghost and a covering of faith uh, over your family? And, and when your kids, your winery teenage kids get in their car and you can pray, God, keep your hand on my babies, and He will. You would think everybody want to do it. Come on now, there's got to be somebody in here. There's got to be amongst this crowd. There's got to be somebody in here who has just been lost in the power of the Holy Ghost before. Who have just found yourself speaking in a heavenly language under almost no unction of your own. And, and the whole world has been shut out for a few minutes. And, and you feel like all of heaven, Gabriel, Michael, and, and Jesus Christ are all standing there. And they're waving their, their wings over you or something as it were. You know, I understand what I'm saying. And, and it would appear on the surface that everybody would want to do it. But the Bible contradicts that. The Bible says, few there be that are going to find the right way. From an from a apostolic, Holy Ghost filled perspective, Brother Rice, I can't wrap my mind around it. Look here in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Now we're starting to see why there's some separation made. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Oh, man. So that means that there are going to be folks walking the earth today who pray, who have seen miracles done when they pray that are going to stand before God and he's going to say, sorry, you're going to hell. Because Brother Cody, we're not talking about ranked sinners right here. We're not talking about people, you know, that, that you know, lying and raping and killing and, and blowing people up and stuff. We're talking about folks that, that, as Peter tells us, I believe it is, or 2 Timothy tells us, they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Look at here, straight from our first verses. It comes from a root word, S-T-E-N, sten, as seen in stenazo, which means to groan, and stenagmos, which means groaning. And it is used figuratively, and I'm still reading the definition, Matthew 7, 13, and 14, of the gate, which provides the entrance to eternal life, and it calls it narrow, because it runs counter to natural inclinations and the way is similarly characterized. Now the word narrow comes from the Greek word thalibo, which means to press. It means to be hemmed in like a mountain gorge. The way is rendered narrow by the divine conditions, which it make it impossible for any to enter who think the entrance depends upon self-merit or who still incline towards sin, who still are lean towards sin and living a, a, a pleasurable life to the flesh, or desire to continue in evil. Listen, the way of the Lord is never going to change. He is, as he introduced himself in the beginning, the I am. He's not the I used to be or the I will be. He's the I am. Now look at here. He's the way, truth, and life, as I said earlier. There is no way into a relationship with God except through Jesus Christ. Now look at here. The way of the Lord is, in fact, appealing. Living for God is appealing. Obedience to the principles of God affect us spiritually, physically, emotionally, and financially in any other way you can think of. All in a good way. 
You live for God, you'll be better spiritually, better physically, better emotionally, better financially. Yet for many, now think about that. Yet for many, they run the decision whether I'm going to live for God or not by how it's going to affect them. Now, this is a dangerous paradox to entertain. I know there's blessings and I know there's healing and I know you go to heaven if you obey the Bible. But I got to see how it affects me first. What's, what's going to have to change? What am I going to have to do? Now the scripture lets us know straight and narrow. They mean groaning. They mean restricted. And the, the scriptures let us know there's going to have to be a sacrifice, a groaning, a restricted lifestyle. The flesh resists. The flesh resists and resents the intrusion of the spirit. Because when the Spirit of God intrudes into your life, it automatically starts making changes. It'd be like somebody showing up, me, like, I'll just use this, it'd be like me showing up at Sister Maria's house, and I'm the Holy Ghost, and that's the flesh, and I go in and start rearranging all the furniture and taking everything out of the cabinets and changing it and going through it. She's automatically going to say, what you doing, brother? That's what happens when the Holy Ghost comes into your life. He starts rearranging and making things because when you said, Lord, I want your spirit in my life, you were declaring, I don't want to keep on being like I am. <laughs> but, but, the flesh always resents the intrusion of the spirit. Now, this is another decision. We don't decide this. It's decided for us. Because Brother Rice David said, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now look here, we don't have to die a literal death for our sins. You don't. Jesus did that for us. We do, however, have to die to the flesh. This is Repentance. Anyone who truly repents, that's a change of mind primarily. Anyone who truly repents is assured of receiving the Holy Ghost as long as they believe. And the way for us is the same as it was for Jesus Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 tell us that. But what we cannot do... And I feel this so heavy in my spirit. We cannot wait around hoping that he will change. And as he changes, that will make our decision for us. Because if I can fit the Lord into my box, if I can fit the Lord into my comfort zone, if I can fit the Lord into my life somehow and weave him through the parts of my life and let me keep the parts I like and get rid of the parts I don't, I'm in. I'm in. I'm for it. I'm for it. I can't tell you the people that have told me, I, if, if you let me dress like I want to and live like I want to, I want to come to your church. I never felt nothing like that in all my life. You know what I tell them? Come on. Y'all know the rules. Don't mean to embarrass our guests, but I got one rule for how you dress to come to church. Do it. Don't come naked. That's probably because couldn't none of us keep our mind on what we was doing. Because I do have Bible for the Lord delivering a naked man too. <laughs> Don't get nervous. We're not going to start opening up. I'm not going to hang a pole in the middle of the aisle or nothing. But we cannot wait around holding on until the Lord changes and all of a sudden we now can fit ourselves to him. We must learn to rely upon the strength of the Holy Ghost because the Bible said the Holy Ghost is the comforter. That word means helper. He fully intends to keep us on the right path if we'll simply choose to follow his leading. This is why there will be lifestyle limitations in living for God. You want to live for God? You better be ready to first there be some changes made. God is holy. And he will not compromise his holiness for you or anybody else. And if we live our lives with no limitations with regard to culture, society, and fashion, we have not submitted ourselves to God, but we've submitted ourselves to the world. 
Oh, I'm my own man. I do what I want. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 6, verse number 16, 